All right, have a seat. Welcome again to the Beltline Church of Christ. So thankful that you're here today as we continue on our series of lessons we've entitled Scattered, the Gospel Set Free. We're in Acts chapter 2 this morning, if you want to be opening your Bibles there to the second chapter of the book of Acts. We're going to spend the majority of our time right there today. Have you ever wondered why Jesus didn't employ the usual means of preserving his legacy? Have you ever thought about that? Why didn't Jesus do what everybody else does to preserve a legacy. I mean, if you think about it, we have absolutely nothing pinned from the hand of Jesus. Jesus seems unconcerned about official manuscripts. He doesn't enlist a scribe who can record all of his teachings. And if we think about how that works today, we know that's completely different than the way preserving legacies work, right? I mean, if a president leaves office today, they open a presidential library to preserve and display the significant documents from their administration and their media moments. Oftentimes, a former president will write their memoirs to try to reshape history a little bit about how great their time in office was. And my question is, why didn't Jesus try this same approach? Why doesn't he write anything down? Why does he not employ the usual means for preserving his legacy? And I don't know the answer to that, but I do know this. I know that Jesus, instead of using the regular means that we know of today, relies on two different things to carry on his life and to carry on his mission. The first is the Holy Spirit, which is better than any memoir that could ever be written. He relies on the Holy Spirit to carry on his life and his mission, and he relies on, number two, his disciples. These are the two methods that Jesus employs, if you want to call them methods, to carry on his legacy. His life was transferred to their life by the Spirit and by his association with and his investment in his followers. You see, the legacy Jesus wanted to leave behind was the transformed lives of ordinary men and ordinary women who could carry on his work after he returned to the Father. This is why he didn't write any books. This is why he didn't do any of those things. He had a much better plan in place that the Holy Spirit and his followers would carry on his work after he left his, this place and returned to the Father. And that leads us to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, I believe, is one of the most significant and important chapters in the entire 66 books of the Bible. It reveals to us the beginning of the church, and it shows us the unbelievable power of God, among many other things. I remember when I was in high school, I had a Bible school teacher who challenged me to memorize the whole chapter, and I thought, eh, not that big a deal. What's so important about Acts chapter 2? Oh, that I had known what I know then, now, what, well, you know what I mean. Oh, how I wish I knew then what I know now. That's what I'm trying to say. Listen to this, Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. All through the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit is portrayed time and time again as God's water, God's wind, and God's fire. I don't know if you're familiar with that or not, but that's the metaphors that are used frequently for the Holy Spirit. And here in Acts chapter 2, we're going to see all of these metaphors come to life in this one section of Scripture. We see the mighty rushing wind. We see the tongues of fire dancing on the heads of the apostles. And at the end of chapter 2, we have the waters of baptism washing over 3,000 souls as the Spirit is there in the midst of all of it. But more than that, what I want you to see as we get started this morning, I want you to remember that we serve an amazing God who always, every single time, keeps his promises. <coughs> 
we serve a God who always keeps his promises. Remember what he said in chapter 1? If you think back to our lesson a couple weeks ago, he said, I want you to wait in Jerusalem until the coming of the promise. And here in chapter 2, we have the fulfillment of that promise as the Holy Spirit descends on these apostles. God keeps his promises. When he says something, I want you to know you can take it to the bank. It is true. It is trustworthy. He says it. It's a done deal. So here's what that means. When you and I are told that his yoke is easy and his burden is light, we know that that is a true promise of God, that that is a done deal. When we're told that all authority in heaven and earth resides with Jesus, we know that that is a true statement. When we are told that God shows no favoritism, we can take that to the bank. When we are told that each of us will give an account to God for the things that we've done in the body, we know <coughs> excuse me, that there is a great day coming. And we're told that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we can know that that is true and sure as the fact that we are sitting right now in this building. When we are told the Lord knows those who are His, we can rest assured that that too is a true statement. When we are told Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, we don't have to guess or wonder if that's true because it is. Why? Because God keeps His promises. His word is true. When we are told to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God so that in the proper time we might be exalted, that is exactly what's going to happen. When we're told that the testing of our faith produces patience, rest assured that our trials do have purpose and meaning and God keeps his promises and when we are told that he is coming with the clouds and that every eye will see him and every knee will bow we might as well bow now because God is a promise keeping God and it is going to happen praise God his word is true his promises are sure and his love for us is absolutely unending Charles Spurgeon once said God wants us to bring his promises to him. Think about that. God wants us to bring our promises to him. He wants us to believe that what he said is true. And how many times in scripture do you see that happening? Especially in the Old Testament, you have the patriarchs who come to God and they said, well, you know, Lord, you actually said, you remember when you said that? I just want to remind you, God, of what you said when you were talking to me earlier. It's as if they, they are saying, God, I want you to remember. And God wants us to call on him in that way. He wants us to trust in those promises that he's given to us. And why is that so important? I want you to remember that as you go through your week. God keeps his promises. If your week blows up, Remember that he has promised to never leave you, to never forsake you. He's for you. If something doesn't go the way you want, if the diagnosis isn't exactly what it's supposed to be, I want you to know that God has never, ever, ever left you, nor will he. He keeps his promises. I absolutely love that. And because God's promises are certain, we can take God at his word. And so if you take nothing else from the lesson but that today, it will have been time well spent. God keeps his promises. Now, think about that in the context of discipleship. What does that mean? God keeps his promises. In the context of discipleship, do you remember Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20? When he says, go into all the world and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I've commanded you. And then he says something at the end. Do you remember what he said? Lo. There is no lo without the go, by the way, but that's another lesson for another time. He says, lo, I'm with you always, even to the very end of the world, to the end of the age. That's a promise of God. So as we think about discipleship and as we focus on discipleship, what that means is we don't do this discipleship stuff alone. That God is working for us, he is working with us, and he will never leave us alone. Listen to what happens next, verse 5. This is where it gets really interesting. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound of the mighty rushing wind, the multitudes came together. And they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished. I think that's an understatement saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? 
And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one, or w- one another, What does this mean? What does this mean? This is an amazing miracle. Here are all these people from all kinds of different countries and from all different walks of life, and God is right there in the middle of it. His Spirit is making an undeniable impression on every person standing there that day. And I think it's important that we understand that some of the people that were there came from areas like Pontus and Crete and Phrygia. And that's significant because they spoke a very, very, very rare local language, a regional language. And yet even they are hearing the word of God proclaimed in their native tongue. Let me try to illustrate this a little bit better. Imagine for a second that I'm on a plane flying to Nepal. I love Nepal, been to Nepal, it's an incredible place. Got to spend a week and a half, two weeks almost, with, with one of our preaching schools over there, preaching and teaching to the Nepali people. It was an absolutely amazing trip, an amazing experience. The problem was, everywhere I went, I had to have an interpreter with me. Because, I don't know if you knew this or not, but I don't speak Nepali. <laughs> That may come as a shock to you. I really only know one word, and it's namaste. I mean, that's, that's the only word I know. You greet with namaste, it's like aloha. It's hello and goodbye. It's everything, namaste. And so if that's the only word I know, I guess I was doing okay. But, but imagine now with me that I get off the plane, and all of a sudden, I begin speaking in fluent Nepali. Here is this very white, very American, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, very good-looking guy, if I might say so myself speaking fluent Nepali. Do you think that might get the attention of some of the locals? Do you think that someone might say, what in the world is going on here? Well, that's exactly what's happening here in Acts chapter 2. These uneducated Galileans are speaking perfectly in the language of those who are there, and it's making an amazing impact on everyone who's gathered around. But there's something else going on here, and here's what I see. What I see here in Acts chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, is a reversal of the Tower of Babel. Do you remember the Tower of Babel from Genesis chapter 11? If you remember, the barriers between people created by language, that was the punishment for their sinfulness. That, that, that barrier was drawn because they didn't follow God's word. They didn't do what he said. And so God says, let's confuse their language, and that's exactly what happens. But here, those barriers are overcome. So what does that mean? It means that the gospel is for everyone, that no one is excluded, and that God has the power to bring every tribe, every nation, every tongue, and every person together in his kingdom. And what is it that these apostles are talking about? Did you catch it? What are they saying as they're speaking in these different languages, these different tongues? They're talking about the mighty works of God. Do you remember why Babel failed? Because it was all about them. Let us build this tower. Let us, let's make it all about us. It's all about me, me. I don't want to disperse. I don't want to do what God says. We want to make a name for ourselves. We want to make it all about us, but not here. Here, they don't use this amazing gift to glorify themselves They use it to talk about the mighty works of God. Jesus had said earlier back in Matthew chapter 5 to let their light shine for one very important reason. Do you remember? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and do what? Glorify you? No! Glorify your Father who is in heaven. You see, the reason we do what we do as Christians is not to call attention to ourselves, but to call attention to God. The reason we serve, the reason we give, the reason we disciple, the reason we do whatever it is that we do as Christians is not to say, look at us. It's to say, look at the amazing God I serve. How you doing with that? Oftentimes, we want the credit, we want the recognition, we want all that that goes with it. And God said in in the Sermon on the Mount, if that's what you want, recognition, all that, you have your reward. Good luck, go. Go in peace, be warmed and filled. (laughs) But that's not what happens here. And as we think about discipleship, I want you to remember this. 
We are not making disciples who follow us. We don't need any more Steve Smiths in the world. We're making disciples who follow and glorify Jesus. And if we miss that, ah, we've missed it all. But my favorite part of chapter 2 comes in verses 12 and 13. I want you to notice especially verse 13. Listen to what it says. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others, mocking, said they are filled with, two words, underline it, new wine. They're drunk. (laughs) They are filled with new wine. You don't need to listen to these people. But I think something else is going on here. If you have your Bibles, and I know that you do, go back with me to Matthew chapter 9. Underline those two words. You want to write a little reference out next to it. I, I, I don't know if you, if you hold these words as you can't write or underline, but if you do, I, I encourage you to write Matthew 9, 14 through 17 out in the margin of your Bible right here uh, in Acts chapter 2, verse 13, because there's something going on here that I think we miss if we're not careful. Here's what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 9, verse 14. Then the disciples of John came to him and said, Why do you, we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. Another lesson for another time. <clears throat> will fast. <clears throat> will fast. Anyway, verse 16. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment for the patch tears away from the garment and a worse tear is made now listen to verse 17 neither is new wine put into old wine skins why if it is the skins burst and the wine is spilled and the skins are destroyed but new wine is put into fresh wine skins so both are preserved okay What in the world does that have to do with Acts 2? I think Jesus is saying to us, something new is coming here in Matthew chapter 9. And he says this new thing is not something we can just add on to the old way. If you just try to add the new thing to the old, you're going to end up destroying both the old and the new. And so when this new thing comes, even though it may be rooted in the old, it is completely different. And that leads me right into John chapter 2, where we have the first mighty miracle that Jesus ever performed. Do you remember that in Cana of Galilee? He's at a wedding feast, and the wedding party runs out of wine. That is social faux pas. I mean, they were going to become the laughing stock. And so Mary comes to Jesus, and he says, hey, they run out of wine. Do something about it. He says, what's that have to do with me? And he says, she says to the, the little servants that were there, whatever he tells you to do, I want you to do it. And so over here are pitchers of used bathwater. And Jesus says, I want you to take that. And I want you to take it to the master and servant and serve it. And as they are going along, we know what happens, right? The water becomes wine. Now notice verse 9 of John chapter 2. When the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine and did not know where it come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept this new wine, this good wine, until now. It says here that the master did not know where this new wine came from, but the servants did, right? They know that Jesus is the one who brings new wine. And I want you to remember that as well. Jesus is the one who brings new wine. Who can make things new from that which is used and ready to be thrown out? No one other than Jesus. And here's what that means. Jesus can bring new wine into your marriage. If you're struggling, if you're on the edge here, he can bring new wine to that. He can bring new wine to that job that you absolutely hate, that you wonder, why do I do this and how am I going to get out of this? He can bring new wine to that. He can bring new wine to your family and the issues that you're dealing with and the struggles that you have. He can bring new wine to your pocketbook. He can bring new wine to anything that looks like it's all used up, lifeless and hopeless. And I'm here to tell you today, he wants to bring new wine to his church. But if that's going to happen, what he needs from us 
his new wineskins. If Jesus brings the new, and you want to keep doing the same old thing the same old way, it's going to destroy the old and ruin the new. And so what he's saying is, we've got to become the new wineskins for the new wine that Jesus is bringing. That means we've got to have a change of heart that results in a change of action. That's what repentance is all about in the first place, so that we can receive this new, amazing, faith-building thing that God wants to do among us. Remember what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17? He says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, the new has come. In Jesus, we find a new way of looking at life, a new priority, a new excitement, a new forgiveness, new mercies every morning, a new identity, and most of all, a new destiny. And with that new creation comes the new wineskins and the ability to embrace the new wine that only Jesus brings. And that is why, please hear me in the, in the spirit that this is intended, that is why someone who calls themselves a Christian but is not changed by Jesus Christ is kidding themselves. That's why someone who says, I am a follower of Jesus Christ, but thinks I don't have to commit, I don't have to be all in, I don't really have to be about the Father's business, is deceiving themselves. The new wine cannot be simply an add-on to your life. Christianity cannot be an add-on to your life. It's not, I'm a mom, I'm a dad, I'm a husband, I'm a wife, I'm an employee, and I'm a follower of Jesus. No! I am a follower of Jesus Christ, and everything else is an add-on to my faith. That means everything else is influenced by my faith. And so what is so amazing to me is what these mockers, in Acts chapter 2, if we go back there, what these mockers did not understand is this that what they said to try to discredit the apostles, they're full of new wine, was actually right. No, they weren't drunk, as some of them supposed, as we'll read about next week. They're not drunk, but they are definitely full of the Holy Spirit and the new wine that Jesus has ushered in. They themselves were the new wineskins ready to hold this new wine and to pour it into all who were willing to receive it. And my question for you this morning is, are you willing to receive it? Are you willing to receive? Jesus wants to bring new wine. And the thing is, it's not new. It's the same wine he's been offering for all eternity. But anytime Jesus offers it, it's new and it's fresh and it's perfect and it's everything it's supposed to be. And that's what Jesus is offering us as the Church of Christ here in Decatur, Alabama today. I will give you new wine, new purpose, new identity, new meaning, new everything. But you, you have got to become the new wineskins. And what that probably means is there's some repentance that needs to take place maybe right now today. Because if you want to receive this new wine, you've got to have the right heart to do that. And the beautiful thing about God is he says, I'll give you that too. I'll give you the new heart so that you can receive the new wineskins, or the new wine, and you can be the new wineskins, but you've got to trust me and stop trusting yourself. So how about it? Aren't you tired of doing things the same old way and expecting different results? That is the definition of insanity, by the way. Are you tired of your faith being just an add-on to your life? Well, then stop it. Just stop it. Stop making your faith an add-on and start making it the source of your life. Because again, Jesus doesn't want to be part of your week. He wants to be your week, your month, your year, your life. Let Jesus make you into a new creation and pour out the new wine into your life. So how about it? What will you do with this? Will you allow him to change your heart? Will you, will, will you receive the new wine and, and not let it spill out all over the ground and destroy everything, but instead receive it in the way that God wants you to receive it? I hope that you will. And if that means you, like so many have done last week, come and, and you repent and you're baptized and you, and you put on that new, man, do that today. Don't wait another second. If that means there's some things in your life that need to go away so that you can receive this new that God is bringing through Jesus, then do it. 
Don't spend another second outside of the grace of God. And we want to help you with that. If we can pray for you or if there's anything we can do, we invite you now while we stand and we sing this song for your encouragement.